Ryszard Kuklinski, codenamed Jack Strong, a Polish and American hero, helped the United States defeat Soviet Russia. In Moscow, he obtained top secret plans for Red Army aggression in Europe. He prevented the outbreak of the Third World War, in which Poland was to have become a nuclear wasteland, and Polish soldiers cannon fodder for the Russian marshals. Sentenced to death by the communists, he was exonerated by Free Poland. His life and activities in the year 1971 to 1981 represent the most important intelligence mission of the Cold War. Measured by political and military consequences, he was the most important US intelligence agent of the 20th century. Colonel Kuklinski, posthumously promoted to general, risked his life and the lives of his family by making difficult decisions. He was possessed not only of military courage, but also ordinary civil courage too. In Moscow, he gained possession of strategic plans for Soviet aggression towards Western Europe and NATO states, which he then handed to the Americans. These were in fact the plans for the unleashing of a third world war by the evil communist empire. By providing these plans to the Americans, General Kuklinski helped the United States to win the Cold War. This has been confirmed not only by the political, military and intelligence authorities of the United States, but also by Soviet marshals and generals. For the Poles, a Third World War would have been a catastrophe, regardless of its outcome. General Kuklinski, head of the Strategic Defense Planning Department of the General Staff of the Polish Army, was also the secretary of the Polish delegation to meetings of the Warsaw Pact, as well as the liaison officer between Red Army Command and the Polish People's Army. Ryszard Kuklinski said, The efforts of the United States meant that the world avoided a nuclear holocaust, which Moscow included in its strategic plans. The knowledge of what would happen should war begin was overwhelming. For years I had been sticking little mushroom symbols on the huge staff maps signifying nuclear explosions. Blue for the bombs to come from the west, red where ours were supposed to land. There is no doubt that Kuklinski broke his military oath of obedience to the Red Army and the Warsaw Pact. He was spurred to this course of action by the events of December 1970, when unarmed civilians were killed by regular Polish army units, representing Soviet and communist domination. This followed Warsaw Pact aggression in Czechoslovakia in 1968 and the presence of Soviet nuclear weapons on Polish territory. Like most officers, Ryszard Kuklinski was aware of the Soviet Union's attitude towards Polish soldiers. The Polish soldier, whose duty was to defend the independence of the fatherland, was Moscow's enemy. Since the 18th century, the Russian occupier had consigned hundreds of thousands of Polish officers to torment and death in Siberian labor camps. In 1940, Stalin sentenced around 22,000 Polish officers prisoners of war to death by firing squad in the Katyn forest. It was an act of revenge for the defense of Poland in 1920. Andrzej Melak, chairman of the Katyn committee, member of parliament of the Republic of Poland. The Katyn massacre remains a little known subject in Poland and internationally. For decades, the Russian intelligence services, along with those of the PRL, Polish People's Republic, did everything to falsify the greatest genocide ever perpetrated on Polish prisoners of war, in which half the officer corps perished. The crime has never been brought to justice and nobody has been punished. After World War I, which resulted in Poland regaining independence, Russia and Germany were the powers most displeased by the Treaty of Versailles. As early as 1922, they signed a bilateral treaty of cooperation in Rapallo. Despite their rivalry and visible ideological differences, they were never enemies. 
When Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, he began violating the provision in the Treaty of Versailles on the demilitarization of Germany. The country developed its military to an unimaginable extent, with its armoured divisions and specialists practicing manoeuvres on Russian training grounds. Meanwhile, the Russians built tanks and aircraft, employing German blueprints, accompanied by intensive military exercises. In spring 1939, Hitler demanded a corridor and the transfer of the free city of Danzig under his personal jurisdiction. That May, Foreign Minister Josef Beck famously said, There is only one thing in the lives of men, nations and countries that is without price. That thing is honour. It became clear that the outbreak of World War II was only a matter of time. The Poles forged a cooperative alliance with Britain and France. On the 23rd of August 1939, German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop signed an infamous pact with Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov, guaranteeing Soviet participation in aggression against Poland. Along with the division of Poland and other countries, that had regained independence in 1918. Hitler attacked on the 1st of September 1939. 17 days later, the Soviet offensive from the east began. Stabbing Poland in the back. Around 250,000 Polish officers and soldiers were captured. In three officers' camps, the Russians conducted intensive interrogations over roughly six months. Collecting information, they found that most of the Poles did not wish to cooperate with Soviet Russia. The top Soviet authorities decided that the Polish officers would be murdered. On the 5th of March, orders were issued and the officers were sent away from the camps in groups of around 250. Some of them to Katyn. The Russians did not lack cynicism. The Polish officers were seen off by a Russian military band. There was a farewell meal and food for the journey. Bread and herrings wrapped in grey paper. The Poles did not know where they were going. Those who stayed behind in the camps even envied them. It turned out that they were travelling to the area around Smolensk, Russia. Where they were transferred to black buses, their windows painted over with lime. They drove 16 kilometers deep into the forest towards an NKVD base, which included a villa and a recreation center. The officers' hands were tied and coats thrown over their heads. Some were tied in such a way that any movement would cause suffocation. As exhumations later revealed, some had been stabbed with bayonets and some shot at repeatedly. Także kłuci bagnetami, do niektórych strzelano 
The exhumations also showed how some officers had tried to defend themselves in the face of death. This crime against Polish prisoners of war was discovered less than a year later. When Stalin's closest ally, Hitler, attacked him on the 22nd of June, the Western Allies decided to help Russia. And force Poland to sign a treaty of peace and cooperation. After the agreement was signed, it was decided that a Polish army would be formed within the Soviet Union. It would be made up of Poles freed from prisons labor camps and other camps. These returning people were shadows of themselves. And required immediate medical treatment. Among those returning, the officers were missing except for about 400 from the camp in Gryazowets. Who had somehow been saved. Some of the officers decided to cooperate with the Russians, including Colonel Zygmunt Berling and Captain Leon Bukoyemski. Who had been transferred from their camp to the outskirts of Moscow, where they enjoyed excellent living conditions. Meanwhile, a search for the missing Polish officers began. Józef Czapski, the officer chosen for this mission, traveled and searched in vain. In 1944, German radio announced that graves of Polish officers had been unearthed near Smolensk. The Poles demanded that the International Red Cross be involved in investigating the crime. The Germans took several dozen forensic experts, pathologists, and other representatives from the territories they were occupying. There were Polish experts too, who saw some of the exhumations. There was an autopsy of over 4,000 bodies exhumed between April and June 1944. Their pockets were checked, revealing hundreds of identifiers that confirm the same thing. The corpses had been preserved by the dry Smolensk soil, which slowed down decomposition. The prisoners of war lay in broad pits in 13 layers. 
w trzynastu warstwach położeni jak na przemian. Tak jak like can sprats. w puszkach z konserwami. Two generals were identified during the exhumations, Mieczysław Smorowinski and Bronisław Bohaterowicz. The Germans reburied them in a separate grave. The news spread around the world. The German information efforts had a purpose to stir up discomfort in the Allied camp and eliminate Poland from it. In practice, this succeeded. When the Polish Red Cross applied for permission to take part in the exhumations, Moscow was strong enough to say no to the Americans and the British. The USSR then broke off diplomatic relations with Poland. It is unlikely that any reaction by Poland, even an acceptance of Russia's claim that the Germans had committed the crime, would have changed Stalin's position. He was acting systematically to annihilate Poland and the Polish government in exile in London. He had already created the ZPP, Union of Polish Patriots, with Wanda Wasilewska, composed of Polish communists, and was forming an army of Polish communists with generals Świerczewski and Berlin. He was strong enough to impose anything on the West, which caved and betrayed Poland for a second time. Lies about Katyn flourished in Poland during the 1950s and 1960s, promoted by the Russians. They set up the Burdenko Commission and exhumed the bodies again after the Germans had retreated westwards. They planted newspapers and documents from 1941 to support their myth. That lie, which was the founding act of the PRL, lasted until the 1980s and 90s. It still persists in Russia, despite some politicians and historians there who question German responsibility for the crime. There are no other examples in modern history of a nation's elite being murdered. The murdered Poles included politicians, 700 pilots, professors, doctors, around a thousand foresters, and osadniks, veteran soldiers and volunteers granted land. The cream of the Polish intelligentsia. The officers in Katyn were murdered more than once, first through physical annihilation, later their memory being destroyed. The crime against them also affected their families, who were treated as second or third class. They were denied good jobs, and the secret police watched them constantly. Any mention of Katyn or efforts to tell the truth about it often ended in death, 
or prison and persecution. During the 1970s, we were able to watch original footage of the exhumations filmed by the Germans in the parish where I lived that of Father Václav Karłowicz, a hero of the Warsaw Uprising. We also knew the topography of that place inside out. We decided to erect a Katyn monument to all those Polish heroes who had been forgotten, murdered and persecuted for decades. We set about realizing our idea. Early on the 31st of July 1981, we removed the sections of the monument from my brother Arkadiusz's garage, loading them into two cars owned by the municipal cleaning company. Only such vehicles were allowed to enter the military cemetery. We arranged to meet by the Dolinka Katinska, Cat in Hollow. Everything worked out. After less than 20 minutes of waiting, we were allowed in. An hour and a half later, a five-meter-high monument, with sections weighing several hundred kilograms each, had been built with the help of Poles visiting the cemetery. At the time, the whole Polish capital was visiting Powązki Cemetery for the 1st of August anniversary of the start of the Warsaw Uprising, along with people who had fought in it, now scattered worldwide. We wanted this memorial to our murdered friends, officers, and to those who still lived and remembered. To proclaim the truth about the Katyn massacre, we erected the memorial, posed for a photograph, and feeling we had done our duty, went home. My brother Stefan went on to Warsaw Cathedral, where he announced the news. Those who believed him were not idle. They went to Powązki to see the monument for themselves. Those who left it until the next day did not see it, as unknown perpetrators removed it during the night. They desecrated the monument and the cemetery using heavy equipment. The memorial disappeared for 14 years. In 1989, despite an inquiry, the perpetrators remain unidentified. That year, the memorial was deposited outside the cemetery, packaged like the finest export goods. Only the 300 kilogram cross, which held the entire statue together, was missing. It had probably been melted down and used for a statue of one of the communist leaders. The struggle to re-erect the statue lasted from 1989 until 1995, well into Free Poland. In 1985, General Wojciech Gerazelski had erected another monument with the false inscription 1941 and the offensive words to the Polish soldiers murdered on the soil of Katyn in 1941 by Hitler's Nazis. This simply went too far. People painted over, covered and took apart the statue, but the regime remained in place. 
In May 1995, news arrived that the Voivod, central governor, and the mayor of Warsaw had agreed to have Jaruzelski's false monument taken down and the historical memorial reinstated. We set about erecting it. Then the cemetery's director ran over, shaken. Waving a piece of paper at me, he cried, Gentlemen, stop, stop, don't do anything, there's a telegram. Signed by Marshal of the Same, Marek Borowski, and Prime Minister Józef Oleksii, the telegram annulled the voivod and the mayor's decision, ordering that work on the monument be halted. My friend Józef Szaniawski and I decided then to commemorate the murdered Polish officers and soldiers in the center of the capital, joining forces with the Polish community in Chicago, and Colonel Richard Kuklinski, Nobody wanted to give us a place for the memorial. We liked a location behind Warsaw's defensive walls. Of course, the authorities did not provide their consent. There was, however, a small square where the monument had initially stood, next to a cafe. It turned out that it was managed by the Polish Cultural Foundation. My brother, Stefan Melak, visited the foundation. While talking to the secretary and finding out who could make the decision, the telephone rang. It was Mrs. Beata Tiskiewicz from Italy, the foundation's director. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Stefan asked her whether the Katyn monument could be erected there. She agreed without hesitation. So at 4 a.m. on the 7th of May 1988, we transported the stone ourselves, planted cedar trees on the square and affixed a plaque. The memorial was up. For the unveiling of the monuments, we invited Colonel Kuklinski, the first Polish officer in NATO, who prevented the outbreak of World War III and revealed Russian imperialist plans to attack Europe, plans that would have involved half a million Polish soldiers. Foreseeing the consequences of the attack and aware that Poland would cease to exist, he made every possible effort to contact American intelligence. This providential figure saved Poland, Europe and the world. We should always remember him. Many Polish defenders of the fatherland, whom we should never forget, died in Katyn. We should never abandon efforts to punish and judge the perpetrators. As an unpunished crime is a crime that can be repeated at any time. Today, the only memorial stands in the heart of Warsaw, on Castle Square, a reminder of Warsaw's history and unhealed wounds. General Ryszard Kuklinski said, the highest Soviet leadership knew, by issuing the order to execute the officer corps of the Polish army, it was depriving the nation of her defensive forces and simultaneously annihilating her commanding elite, thereby also destroying the army's national tradition.
No other Allied country fighting the Nazis in the Second World War lost so many officers. And although the Polish officers, treacherously murdered with a bullet in the back of the head, as prisoners of war, did not die on the field of battle, they died because Stalin recognized them to be the implacable enemies of the Soviet totalitarian state.